Hello, my name is Peter Parfit and welcome to the second part of the construction of the new workshop. I thought I'd just show you something which is quite neat. And this is the setup. I've got Superdog here, Superdog there. And my guide rail always goes against the tall Superdogs. But I've got some uh, of the pups here. There's one there, one there, and one there. Now these, which I've just been using, I push my stock against and I can get a 45 degree cut. And these two as a pair, I can get a right angle cut. And I'm in the process of doing lots of uh, pieces of wood which have got a 45 degree cut at one end and then a right angle. And so this is the perfect setup. And there I have my two pieces of wood, each with a 45 degree cut at one end and a 90 degree cut at the other. Perfect. Now I've brought my CMS TS unit uh, up to the uh, new location, uh, but I forgot the fence. Uh, a silly thing to do. And I don't recommend that you, you do this. This is not, not a very safe way of doing things, but I've just put a big lump of wood here, held on with two clamps as a temporary fence but uh, you should really use the, the proper festal one. Now what I'm doing is I'm making up a bunch of shims. And let me tell you why. Well, after the first video about the new workshop, uh, I said I was gonna try and do something about leveling the floor, etc. So many people said to me, you really must put battens down and then put a chipboard floor on top. And I've taken that advice and that's what I'm doing now. Now this floor is so uneven. It goes from zero over there to about 40 in the, in the middle here, dip. Uh, and then it's uh, about 15 at this end here. So it goes like that. And as it goes across this way, it goes up and down a little bit as well. So I've got my batten. This batten is 25 millimeters uh, thick and it's about 38 millimeters wide. It's pressure treated and uh, it's reasonably dry, which is quite good. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm using the batten, my spirit level, and uh, shims which I'm making up out of uh, bits of uh, wood. What I've done is I spent a long time getting that first run uh, level across there. So that's my reference, and I'm going to work this way, and I'm going to work that way. And although I'm going to have battens in the middle here, I'm doing these in... Uh, twos because it's more accurate to use your spirit level over its maximum capability. In fact, technically I could have gone to, to here. Um, but anyway, I'm doing it in twos like this. And that allows me now, having got that one level, uh, to put my shim under here to see if it's the right thickness, check with my spirit level, and then uh, cut the shim, put it underneath and screw it down. Now, had I realized I'd be doing this, I would have got a wedge and I would have graduated it in uh, millimeter measurements down here so that I could shove a wedge underneath here and read off where it was and it would say, you need an eight millimeter, 15 millimeter or whatever shim. I haven't got that luxury, so <laughs> never mind. Now I'm just cutting some domino joints. If you imagine I've got two garage doors and remember, I had that bit of a flood the other day, water coming in under the garage doors. Well, I've had the drains sorted out, but I really do need to make sure it could not possibly happen again. So I'm having a little flood barrier at each of the doors. And if you can imagine just on the inside of each door, I've got a strip of Oroco, which is going to be uh, sealed to the floor uh, and screwed down. And at either end, I've got a couple of pieces which will go back in, uh, returns to the wall, uh, which will also be seated and sealed in. And so therefore, this will form uh, a bund or a barrier for any water that might try and get in. That's the theory anyway. So I'm, I'm domino jointing this. Um, thank goodness I brought my domino with me. Uh, I very nearly didn't. Um, I'm using eight by forties. I'm, I'm using uh, this particular little gadget, uh, the trim stopper, uh, and it's really, really good. 
because it is set to the uh, width of my wood and I've got some domino joints to sink in here and here and the same at the other end and when I rotate this now like so that helps me centre my domino cut. I've marked my lines where I've got to put the base of the domino here so that the domino joints are absolutely perfect. My piece of wood uh, that forms the actual boundary at the garage door now has been scribed. Uh, I've also drilled the, the holes for the raw plugs and you might just be able to see the yellow tops of the raw plugs which are already in place. I've cut some strips of rubber and this rubber is about uh, four millimetres in thickness and I'm going to fix this onto the outer edge all the way around of my piece of wood. I'm then going to use some sealing compound uh, for the other half of the underside of this piece of wood and then pop it into place and then I'll put an extra bit of the squidgy stuff on afterwards. I'm just holding this rubber on temporarily with the stapler. Well, I've really cleaned the area up uh, as best as I can. Perhaps I should have uh, scratched off uh, some of this old paint, but I, I think it's pretty sound. And I'm going to use some grip fill. This is a, a product uh, made by Evo Stick. I bought it from Screwfix, um, and it's uh, all weather, all purpose, general purpose, uh, gap filling adhesive. And I'm using that on the inside, and I've got my uh, rubber on the outside and then I'm going to screw it down. So I'm going to apply this fairly liberally now. Now, when you're using a filler, as I am, as a sealant, it's very important that you don't over-tighten screws to squeeze out all the sealant from underneath. And the reason that is very simple. The sealant is flexible, and so it's got gap-filling capabilities. It can expand and contract as the piece of wood might move a bit. But if you over-tighten it, that's going to squeeze out most of that filler and there'll be a very, very thin layer left. And with such a thin layer of sealant, just the smallest amount of movement can uh, cause a leak to uh, go across that sealing barrier. Now, I'm going to be using belt and braces, and you'll see in a minute, I'm going to have a, a second sealing layer on this side and a third one eventually on the other side. I'm not doing that one for a while. Now, my second line of defence is this strip of the baton, uh, which goes all the way along uh, behind the Oroco, and underneath it, there's a very generous amount of that grip fill, and that is screwed down to the floor. Well, the first part of the flooring in this large area of the workshop uh, is now complete. I've put the uh, battens in, uh, and they're pretty much level. Uh, you're within about a millimetre or so. <laughs> And the next stage is to cut some polystyrene. You might just be able to see it against the wall in the distance over there. I'm going to cut that into strips so it fits down between the battens. I'm going to put a layer of polythene on top of that uh, as a um, moisture barrier. And then on top of that goes the chipboard flooring. Now, ordinarily, with this method of doing the flooring, uh, you would put some form of something like grip fill or something like that. Uh, along the tops of the battens and then put the uh, chipboard flooring on top of that. I'm not going to bother with that. Uh, the idea of that is to stop creaky boards and that sort of thing. I'm not worried about that. Well, we're making good progress now. We've got all the 
polystyrene insulation in this half of the larger part of the workshop. I'm about to put the plastic down and then I'm going to do the boards on this side so that I can then move my uh, workbench over to there and continue with this side. Now, I was going to cut the polystyrene with the jigsaw using a festal blade which is serrated. And I thought it would do the job, but actually it was not really designed for that. It's designed for the, uh, the wadding type of insulation. And so rather, rather than give up on the blade, I've put a handle on it. And it's actually really good for cutting individual sheets. And it took me no time at all to do uh, this half of the larger part of the workshop. So plastic next. Now you can probably see that I've not only done the polystyrene, I've also put the uh, layer of plastic uh, down on that half uh, and I've started putting uh, the flooring in place. Now I should point out that in order to do the shims underneath in the end I made loads and loads of different thicknesses, had those with me and I just tried them and made sure it was level and then screwed them in place. Right, well, I think we're making really good progress now. I've got uh, three layers of the sheeting done and one more layer, and then uh, that's this half of the workshop or this half of this part of the workshop done. So I'm really pleased with that. I just want to mention about the way up that the chipboard is being laid. Now, according to my research, this is the way it should be laid uh, with this sort of lip on top. And I think that's because it then closes up nicely and so on and so forth. And at the other end, it would be like this. But all the damage to my chipboard uh, has occurred on this edge here. And that's an edge that would show. And there's been a lot of damage. It came um, on a big lorry, forklift truck, lifted off in one go, etc., on a pallet. And so I'm laying mine this way. So any damage to this part here gets lost. And I haven't found a single case so far where this edge has been damaged or that edge. So I, th I think for me that's the right solution. And I accept that there are some experts out there who will say, oh you've done this absolutely wrong, it's going to fall to pieces in five minutes, etc, etc. Well, it's a workshop. I, I'm not worried if it's not absolutely precise and there's a tiny gap there, or whatever it might be. I just don't want all that writing all over my workshop floor because I'm certainly not going to paint it. Now, ordinarily, I'm workshop based, which means I can go and find whatever specialist tool I need to do whatever job it might be. But in doing this workshop build, I've come here with just the bare essentials. And I, I think actually the, the capability I've got here is the sort of capability that if you're working from the back of a van and going to job sites and so on, and this might be uh, the collection of tools and collection of capabilities that you might have. And I have to say uh, that having a track saw cutting station where you can do right angle or 45 degree cuts is so essential. It really is. And doing this flooring, I'm cutting my flooring absolutely perfectly at right angles. And so it really does make a difference. Many thanks for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.